So good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to welcome everybody to the last talk from this season. This year, we had the great pleasure of receiving renowned speakers and to promote meaningful discussions in a diverse range of topics related to thermodynamics. And today, the Atom Seminar has the great pleasure of welcoming the doctor to Ananda Costa Lourenço. Dr. Lourenço received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Federal University of Alfenas, Brazil, in 2012. In 2015, he completed his master in the same institution. In 2019, he completed his PhD from Fluminense Federal University in Brazil and from Notre Dame University in the US. In 2020 and 21, he conducted his postdoctoral research at the University of Sao Paulo, and currently he is a postdoctoral research in the Mulliken Center for Theoretical Chemistry at Bonn University in Germany. His research interests are primarily in the molecular dynamic simulations applied to liquids, electrolytes, and systems aimed for gas capture and batteries. Once again, welcome, Professor Lorenzo. Thank you so much for being here, and please feel free to start your presentation. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, today I'm going to talk about ion pairing in ion liquids based electrolytes. Uh, the idea of uh, this talk is try to summarize and overview uh, what if we know about ion pairing, how we can define ion pairing in ion liquids based electrolytes and also ion liquids, and how we can measure uh, the influence of the ion pairing in the electrolyte transport properties. Uh, before I start, I would like to say thank you for all the agents that make possible my work, uh, and also University of Sao Paulo and also University uh, of Bonn. Uh, and just to highlight the, the results that I'm going to uh, show today is not just my results, I result from all my collaborators, all my colleagues. So thank you for all my collaborators. So before I start, just a, a small introduction about myself. So uh, as Nicolas said, I did my doctorate degree in University Federal Fluminense in Niterói, so close to Rio, close to Athens. Uh, Professor Luciano Tavares uh, Costa was my supervisor in that time, and I also had the opportunity to go abroad. So I worked at the University of Notre Dame with Professor Edward McGee and Professor Jan Zeng, and also in the University of Uppsala with Professor uh, Daniel Brandel. Uh, in my PhD, uh, I started to work with molecular dynamic simulation of analytics based electrolytes for lithium batteries. And I had the opportunity to work with different ion liquid systems like uh, aprotic heterocyclic anions, uh, binary mixtures of ion liquids. So we are using two different ion liquids in the same electrolyte and also uh, ionogel electrolytes. Once I finished my PhD in 2019, I moved to University of Sao Paulo in Sao Carlos, Sao Carlos Institute of Chemistry. Uh, to start my postdoctoral research uh, under supervision of Professor Juarez da Silva in the Ketanano group. Uh, in the Ketanano group, I had the opportunity to make my research topic uh, more broad. So I started to work uh, with sodium ion electrolytes. And also, uh, I had the opportunity, I have the opportunity to establish some uh, collaborations with other co workers. Uh, in transition metal oxides and metal uh, nanoparticles, and also zeolite materials. Uh, Ketenano uh, group is part of the Computational Material Science and Chemistry Division from the Center for Innovation on New Energy, CINI, that is a virtual research center sponsored by FAPESP and the uh, Shell Oil Company. Uh, in CINI, we have uh, four different uh, branches of research, so different uh, Divisions. So we have dense energy careers, advanced energy storage, mechanical products, and computational material science and chemistry. That is the theoretical uh, branch of CINI, and Professor Juarez is the PI on this division. And also, now, right now in this time, we have some open positions for postdoc uh, at the Ketanon Group and also in the theoretical division of CINI. So if you are looking for positions or are interested at, in doing a postdoc, please contact Professor Juarez Silva. Uh, here is uh, his email. 
And uh, in 2022, last year, I moved here to Bonn in Germany to work as a visiting postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bonn, the Millikan Center for Theoretical Chemistry, uh, under supervision of Professor Barbara Kirchner in the Kirchner Group. Here, I'm working with sodium ion uh, Protki, ion liquids, uh, electrolytes for sodium ion batteries, and also with uh, first field development for electrolytes. The Kirchner Group has a broad uh, topic of research. So here they have method development. So if you want, you can check the PCMake software, Travis, and soon also the Conan software. Uh, here they do AB initial calculations and also classical and AB initial molecular dynamics simulations to understand the working principles of ion liquids, the molecular insights about the pilotetic solvents and functional materials and other topics that I didn't highlight here. But if you are interested, please check the website of the group of Professor Barbara Kirchner. So now talking about science, uh, a brief introduction about uh, ionic liquids. So what is an ionic liquid? An ionic liquid is a molten salt that in general is a uh, liquid at temperatures lower than 373 Kelvin. Uh, so ion liquids are salts, so they are composed by ions. And the interesting stuff about ion liquids is that they have very uh, interesting properties that make them useful in different applications. So those properties are uh, negligible vapor pressure, wide electrochemical stability, and also wide thermal stability. That means that we can use uh, ion liquids in different conditions. Also, uh, they have a reasonable ionic conductivity. I use the quote marks in reasonable because uh, since there are ionic systems, we have strong interaction, so strong ion pairing between the ions that led to high viscosity and hinders the conductivity of the system. And uh, in my opinion, the most interesting property about the ion liquids is that they are task specific. So we can look to the ion liquids uh, as like a puzzle toy in which we can break and mount different uh, cations and anions, combine different structures to try to reach specific properties. And why the ionic liquids have uh, so nice features? It's because of the chemistry of the systems are very rich. So we have like hydrogen bonds, weak intermolecular interactions that can lead to the formation of different like uh, nanodomain structures, uh, microterogeneity, and also, of course, we have like the Coulomb interactions. And why we talk a lot about ion pairing in ion liquid based electrolytes, why the ion pairing is too important for us. Uh, when we talk about electrolytes, I think the first stuff that comes to our mind is ion conductivity and transference numbers. And if we go to the lab, and if we measure the ion conductivity of the ion liquids using like impedance spectroscopy, we have one value. But if we measure the same property, but using like NMR, uh, like inertia Einstein uh, method, we see that the impedance spectroscopy has a lower value than the inertia Einstein. And in general, we assume that this lower value is because of the strong ion pair in the system, because of the strong interactions between cation and anion. So this means that if we know how to control uh, the ion pairing, if we understand the ion pairing, we can improve the ion conductivity of the electrolytes and we can improve the performance. So to restart, how we can define an ion pairing? I think it, for everybody, when we say ion pairing, the first stuff that came to our mind, okay, ion pair, so one cation and one anion, one ion and counter ion. And this is okay, this is what is an ion pair. But if we think about ion liquids, things are a little bit more complicated because ion liquids are completely uh, ions. So this means that one ion has a lot of counter ions in its solvation shell. So if we just look for the interaction between the ion and the closest counter ion, maybe we can misleading some information. So we have to, we should use the concept of the ion cage. And what is this? So we have here in the right corner, we have one RDF. So if we look to this RDF, we can use the first minimum in this RDF as a cutoff. And with this cutoff, we can look to our simulations, to our system, and we define this cutoff around uh, the center, center ion. And we say that every counter ion that is within this cutoff is part of this cage. So this is the ionic cage in the system. 
but we have to keep in mind that this cage is dynamic, so the cage can move, the cage can break, and also we can have different cages uh, in the system. And also ion liquids can aggregate. This means that the cages can be together and to, uh, the things can change. So one example here. So if we look here, we have ion cage and ion pair. So ion pair is the closest interaction, uh, is the interaction between the center ion and the closest uh, counter ion. So these two here. And the ion cage is everything that's inside the cutoff. If you look in here to this uh, figure in the right side, we can see purple is the sodium. And if you look, okay, we can define it like one anion, that is the ion pair, is the closest anion to the sodium. And we can define three uh, anions here that are within the ion cage of the sodium. But at the same time, if we look, we have a close interaction between two sodiums here. So this means that those sodiums are going to share the same anions in their cages and also each cage is going to influence the other cage. So this means that in the ion liquids, we always have to be careful when we talk about ion pairing. And how we can measure, how we can uh, take some information about the ion pairing. So uh, what we can do, we can calculate lifetimes for the interactions. So this means that we can say for how long one ion pair stay together or one ion cage stay together. And to do that, what we can see, what we can do is like this. If you look to the figure in the right top corner, we see like on center ion and we have the cage. So we have the counter ions. And in some point in the simulation, one ion can go inside of the cage and another ion can go outside. At the same time, we can see that some ions can go outside and go back inside of the cage in a small fraction of time. So we have to consider two different behaviors. We can consider uh, the continuous cage, that means that every time that one ion goes outside and the other ions go inside, the cage is broken. But also we can consider the intermittent uh, cage, that means that if one ion goes outside, it stays just a small fraction of time and go back inside, we do not consider that this cage is broken, the cage was just broken and uh, rebuilt, so we have like longer uh, lifetimes. These two concepts can be applied for uh, ion pair and also ion cage. And also, all those concepts, all those analyses are already implemented in Travis from Kirchner Group. So if you want to do some kind of analysis, you can use Travis to do that. And here I have some uh, example to show how we can see the influence of the IO pairing, the lifetimes of the interactions in the transport of the ion liquid. So this is a result from Zeng and Megan. Uh, in this paper, what they did, they calculated uh, the diffusion coefficients for cation and anions for several ion liquids and their niche Einstein uh, ion conductivity, and they compared this with the inverse of the ion pair and the ion cage. And what they saw was if you have like a, a long lifetime, like a strong ion pair, and strong correlated, uh, the diffusion and the conductivity is slower. So this means that your system is uh, too correlated and the structures cannot uh, move too much, like you have a, an entire cluster moving together, so you can estimate uh, the dynamics of the system using the lifetimes of the pair and the cage. However, uh, we have to take care uh, about uh, this relation between pair, ion pair, and the dynamics, because depending on the compositions of the systems, this can change. So here is another example. In, here in this example, we have the lifetimes between the lithium and the DCA, so it's the red, uh, the black plot in the figures, and the lithium and TFSI is the uh, red one. So going to A to, uh, to C, in A, we have just a mean DCA with the lithium TFSI salt increasing concentration, and we see that we increase the lifetime for one interaction and decrease for the another. In B, when we add a secondary ion liquid, so we have two ion liquids, we see the same behavior, but now the lifetimes are different. And in C, when we have just one ion liquid in which the anion of this ion liquid is the same from anion from the salt, we see a different behavior. Now, increasing the concentration, we see an increase in the lifetime. So this means that when we have like heterogeneous solvation shell, solvation shell that has more than one interaction mode, the ion pairing, the lifetimes can be different depending on uh, the ion environment. Another way that uh, we have to evaluate the ion pairing in the transport property of the ion liquids 
is looking to the ionic conductivity, as I said in the beginning. But now, instead of using impedance spectroscopy or NMR, we can use the MD simulations. So we can obtain ionic conductivities that is similar to impedance spectroscopy using Einstein help and method, in which we look to the collective mean square displacement of the particles. That means that we are looking to the mean square displacement of the particles, taking account uh, the interaction between there, then, so we are looking to the ion pairing in the system. So if you look to this equation here, we can break uh, the ionic conductivity in the system into five different contributions. So we can have the cross terms between cation and anion. We can have the cross terms between cation, cation, and anion, and anion. And also we can have the self terms between anion and the self terms uh, of the cations. Uh, the self terms are based with the self diffusion coefficients. So is when one uh, anion or cation is just moving alone in the MED simulation. And if we do the summation of the self cation and the self anion, we have the inertia Einstein method. So if we look into this data here, this is a uh, imidazolium TF2N. So we have here the collective MSG. So if we look here in brown, we have the total conductivity of the system. That is the higher value because it's the summation of all those terms. And if you look to the red and the black, these are the self, so the diffusion coefficients of the cation and the anion. That are the terms that contribute more to the ionic conductivity. And also now is one thing that is not countering, uh, is somehow counterintuitive, that is the yellow one. That means that the cross correlation between cation and anion is contributing positively to the ionic conductivity. In general, what we expect at the interactions between cation and anion, because they are correlated, are going to not contribute positively to the uh, ion, ionic conductivity of the system. But why this happen? So this happens because locally, the ions like cation and ion, they are correlated and they are moving together. But when we look to the interactions at long distance, like different shells, they are moving in different positions. So in this case, they are contributing positively to the ionic conductivity of the system. Uh, this methodology to get like this contribution to the ionic conductivity is already implemented in Travis. It's not available to the public yet, but we are going to publish this uh, soon. Uh, also, now that we know what is uh, ion pairing, how the ion pairing can uh, affect the dynamics of the systems and how we can measure the influence of the ion pair, uh, we have to think how the ion pair can affect our MD simulations, our force fields. In general, in the classical MD simulations, uh, we use charts that we obtain from initial calculations from isolated ions in gas phase. And we know that when you do the initial calculation for isolated ion gas phase, we have an overestimation of the charge uh, regarding bulk phase, or even when you have like dimers or clusters in, in gas phase. And if we use these charts, we are overestimating the cold interactions and consequently the ion pairing. So how we can overcome those problems? We can use the, just the empirical scaling of those charts we can just multiply those charts by some constants to have a better uh, description of the experimental data and use uh, this scaled chart. In general, we use the value between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. Uh, or you can do the charge derivation using a dimer, a cluster, a book phase, and use the value of the chart in the MD simulations. Or even you can use polarizable force fields in which you have explicitly the description of the polarizability in the system. And because of that, you have a better uh, description of the ion pairing that is going to improve uh, your results. Here uh, we have some uh, examples. Uh, so this is a uh, data from one PhD student from our group. And uh, what he did here, he scaled the chart of the salt. So we can see that scaling the chart here uh, of the anion and the cation, we have an increase in the MSD. So this means that decreasing the charge, we are going to decrease the strength of the Coulomb interactions that is going to lead to a more diffusive uh, system. Uh, here we have another comparison. So this is an ongoing research that we are doing now and probably are going to uh, submit this work soon. So here we have imidazolium tf 2 and here we have the comparison between two, three different simulations, e scaling charge 0.8, unit charge, and the polarizable force field. 
And here we have uh, the self-distribution coefficients for cation and anion. So as we can see, the unit charge is far away from the experimental data, that is the dashed line. When we look to the scaled charge, uh, in my opinion, personal opinion only, uh, we are close to the experimental value, at least close enough. And when we look to the polarizable force field, we have a really good description of the experimental data. But when we look to the ratio of the diffusion coefficient of the cation and the anion in the outer systems, we see a very nice behavior. We see that all the systems are really close to each other. So this means that uh, if we use it, a simple system, a simple force field with unit charge, we don't have a quantitative description of the property, but we have a really good qualitative description. So the physics of the system is still there. So even using a very simple model, we can describe the physics of the system. And the same happens when we go here to the uh, ionic conductivity. So looking to the ionic conductivity, we see the same behavior. We see that when we have the scaled charge, we are close enough to experimental data. Unit charge, we are far away from the experimental data. But when we have polarizable first fields, we have a good description. But as in the diffusion coefficients, if we look to the qualitative trends, we see that all the system has a very similar behavior. So this means that qualitatively, we can still using uh, simple models, but just a warning, uh, this data is regarding these ion liquids in the zone of twin in the specific conditions in these simulations. So we cannot assume that this will be true for all the systems. So now uh, let's talk about like more practical stuff. So how the ion pairing affects the performance of the electrolyte and how we can overcome the ion pairing or use the ion pairing in our favor to improve the electrolyte. Uh, in general, my main topic of research is sodium ion batteries. And uh, there is a reason to choose sodium ion batteries. Uh, so we are seeking uh, new energy uh, power plants, so solar, uh, photovoltaics, wind, and if we think in all those uh, power plants, we need to use batteries to storage energy, or also we need batteries to transport the energy. And if we think about lithium ion batteries, that are, is for sure the best battery that we have today in the market, uh, lithium is not abundant. That means that lithium is expensive. So we should keep lithium in the applications in which we need the lithium, like uh, portable devices, cars. So, and also, in the larger scale applications, like large batteries in these power plants, we should use more cheap materials, such as the sodium ion batteries. Uh, the sodium ion batteries uh, have a very similar chemistry than the lithium ion batteries. That means that we can use the acknowledgement from the lithium ion battery in the sodium ion battery. And also we can use uh, cheaper materials in the batteries, such as aluminum and iron. So this means that the sodium ion batteries are a really good affordable option to the lithium ion batteries. And why we choose uh, ion liquids based electrolytes? Uh, as I said in the beginning, ion liquids have a wide electrochemical stability. That means that we can work with uh, high working potentials in the batteries. That means if we are looking for a large uh, scale applications, ion liquids are really good candidates. Also, ion liquids have a reasonable ion conductivity and they are stable uh, at several electrode materials. So ion liquids can form like a a stable solid electrolyte interface and cathode electrolyte interface. But as we said uh, in this talk, ion liquids have high viscosity that can hinder the dynamics, so low transference number and low ion conductivity. And also ion liquids can aggregate at the book and also at the surface. So uh, think about the structure of the ion liquid, how we can treat this ion pairing. So we can take advantage of the size and the shape of the ions of the charge, uh, degree of the, the localization of the charge in the uh, ions, and also even we can take advantage of the ionic aggregation in the systems. So uh, let's start with size and shape of the ions. So here we have uh, one a cation, imidazolium, and five different anions. Uh, and here in the bottom, we have transport properties. Uh, so what is interesting here is when we look to the vertical trends that we have in the plots. So we can see like in the middle here, the ion conductivity, we can see in purple, uh, the system that has the lowest uh, ion conductivity, that is the C1, C4. 
and why will there, the system has this low conductivity? We can assume that it is because of the large size of the anion, so just a not too good mass transport. But if you look uh, to the blue one, like the second lowest value that we have is the NF, that is a quite small anion. So size here is not a problem. So why we don't have a good value here? It's because we have all the negative charge or the most negative seats are the oxygens that are close to each other. So this means that the sodium ion is always uh, interacting with the same point, like a uh, same region of the anion. And this leads to a strong ion pairing that leads to a low uh, conductivity and low diffusion coefficients. But if you look to TF2N, TSAC, and TFSAM, uh, we see that in some anions like TFSAN, we have uh, a large uh, negative uh, seats clo close together, like nitrogens and oxygens. But this means that we have different interaction seats. When you look to TSAC, we have asymmetry, so we have different oxygen types. And TF2N, we also can have different interaction modes. So when we look to the solvation shell of the ion with the anions, we can see like in T1, uh, C4, the sodium can occupy just one position, but here uh, size has a bigger effect. When we look to the NF, we can see that the sodium is always interacting basically in the same positions with the three oxygen at the same time, strong interactions. But when we look to TSAC and TFSAM, we see that we can have different interactions modes. So sodium can interact with different oxygen types or different nitrogen types. And when we look to the TF2N, we can see that we have at least two different interaction modes, that is the bidentate and the monodentate. And also we have the flexibility of the dihedral. So this means that if we have a heterogeneous solution shell with different interaction modes, and also a flexible anion, uh, this uh, solvation shell is going to be less stable. So we are going to see the break and the, the forming of the cage more often. That means that the ion pairing will be uh, small and we can improve the transport of the ions in those systems. And uh, if we can trick the structure of the anion to improve uh, the transport of the ion, we also can trick the structure of the cation. So if you look to this uh, ammonium-based cations, uh, we see that when we add a uh, ether chain in the uh, cation, we are going to increase the flexibility of this cation, but we are also adding a negative seat in the structure of the cation that leads to a small, uh, a weaker interaction between the ions that is going to improve the transport and improve the contiguity in the system. But if we add a secondary uh, ether chain, like we increase it too much, uh, the size of the cation, and now the size uh, plays a major role than the interaction. And uh, if we can trick the structure of the cation and the anion, this means that maybe if we use a weakly coordinated anion, we can improve even more the transport of the system. And what is a weakly coordinated anion? A uh, weakly coordinated anion is one anion in which we have reduced electrostatic interactions. This means that we have a large uh, degree of charge localization. So we don't have any specific interaction seat in this structure. So if you look to the bottom of the slide, we see the electrostatic potential of this aluminate, that is this book anion here, and the electrostatic potential of the TF2N and TSAC. In aluminate, we can see there is basically no specific interaction seat. And this is because of the large uh, degree of charge relativization, but also because of this uh, symmetry of the anion. And also in this anion, the anion is bulk. So that means that we can create some kind of uh, aesthetical hindrance to avoid or try to decrease the aggregation in those systems. And if we have a low degree of aggregation, we can go to super concentrated electrolytes. Super concentrated electrolytes is when we have a large uh, mole fraction of the salt, and because of this large uh, mole fraction, we can induce the system to have different uh, diffusion mechanisms and also a better stability uh, against electrodes. So if we look to the transport prepared in the right, we have the three first columns, uh, the systems based in the illuminated, so the red, black, and the green. And if we look to the last one, the fourth one, the right, is uh, systems using TSAC and TF2N as uh, anions. And we can see that increasing the concentration of sodium we see in the illuminated uh, systems an increase in the ion conductivity, an increase in the diffusion coefficient. But in the TFSA, 
and the TSAC, we see a decrease in the in, uh, transport for Paris. And why this is happening? This is happening because we have a weak interaction, so we have a weak ion pair in those systems. If you look here to the left of the slide, in the top, we have the ion cage lifetimes for the interaction between the anion and the sodium. And we can see in black, green, and uh, red, the system with the aluminate. So increasing the concentration of sodium, there is a decrease in the lifetime, because this is the inverse of the lifetime in Y. But when we look to TF2N and TSAC, we see an increase in the lifetime. So when we have more and more sodium, sodium is more uh, free regarding the other systems. And if you look to the right, we can see the special distribution function of the sodium around the anion, the aluminate. And we see that when we increase the concentration of sodium, we see that the sodium can literally occupy all the positions around the anion. So this means that when we have the aggregation of the systems, like uh, solvation shells close to each other, sodium ju can just go uh, through different solvation shells. And uh, when I talk about aggregation in those systems, it's because in general, in ion liquid based electrolyte, when we have like uh, small ions, uh, like small metal ions, like lithium and sodium, uh, they can interact with more than one uh, anion at the same time. And also the anion can interact with more than one sodium at the same time. So we have some kind of bridge, like this structure in the right uh, corner of the slide, in which you, one sodium uh, is sharing one anion with other sodium and vice versa. And this means that sodiums are close to each other. And when we look into the distribution of this aggregate between sodiums, we see that increasing the concentration, there is an increase in the aggregate size. And this led to a different dynamics in the systems. So if we look here, uh, we see this plot. So in the first row, we have a 0.2 mole fraction of sodium in imidazole BCN4. And the last row, we have 0.6. Uh, in B and C, we have uh, the interaction of the slowest and the fastest sodium in each uh, concentration. And so each black point is when sodium is interacting with one anion. So if we look in the 0 0.2 concentration, the top, uh, the sodium, the slowest one and the fast one has this very similar behavior. But when we look in the 0 0.6, we see that the slowest one is trapped in the solvation shell, so it's moving together with the same solvation shell, strong ion pairing. But when we have like the fastest sodium, this sodium is moving across different solvation shells. So this means that if we can uh, force the system to have uh, the behavior like in the fastest sodium, we can increase the performance of the electrolyte. And also this kind of analysis uh, is somehow uh, hard to, to produce in the way that if we just look to the average of uh, everything, uh, this behavior can be uh, misleading because in the average, we have more low sodiums than fastest one. Uh, as final part, uh, we are, this is also an ongoing research now. We are evaluating the behavior of a uh, protic uh, ion liquid versus a protic ion liquid. Uh, the advantages of using Protic ion liquids is first we can have a growth diffusion, that is the proton transfer between the ions. But uh, just to remember, uh, in the classical MD simulations, we cannot see, at least in the OPOS first view that we use, we cannot see the transfer of the proton. Uh, protic ion liquids are also uh, more fluided. That means that we have a better ion conductivity, like larger values than the uh, protic systems. Also, they are easier to synthesize and cheaper. So they are really good candidates for electrolyte. And also the protic ion liquids, because we have a protic hydrogen, they can form hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds can uh, change the behavior of the electrolyte. So uh, in this study, we are comparing the pyridine 14, that is the a protic, so the left side. And we have the pyridine hydrogen 4, in which we replaced the methyl group uh, from the nitrogen by one protic hydrogen. And because of this protic hydrogen, this cation now can do strong uh, hydrogen bonds uh, with the anion. So if we try to characterize the behavior of these two ion liquids regarding the effect of this uh, sodium salt concentration, first, if we look to the self-diffusion coefficients, we see that increasing uh, 
the amount of sodium, we have a similar behavior in the two systems. That is the decrease of the self diffusion coefficient because we are increasing the interactions between sodium and anion, so more ion pairing, and this decreases the mobility of the systems. And if we look to the transference numbers, everything is similar. The only difference that we can notice here is that in the perigenial hydrogen 4, the protic uh, system, we have higher values that came from the higher uh, fluidity. Uh, also, if we try to look to the solvation shell of sodium in both systems, we see a very similar behavior. Like the first row, uh, we have sodium and the anion, uh, center of mass. The second row, we have interaction of sodium and the oxygen from the anion. Uh, left side, we have perigenium 14, a protoxy, and right side, perigenium uh, hydrogen 4, the protoxy. And as we can see, same behavior, basically same coordination numbers, nothing's different. Uh, if we look to the change in the dihedral of the anion, so CSSC dihedral, we can see that increasing the concentration of sodium going to black to blue, uh, we change the, uh, the conformation of the anion, but even this is quite similar in the two systems. Uh, we can say that we have a small difference uh, in the populations, especially when we look to the black one. We have uh, some shoulders that are not too prominent uh, in the product system, but in the end of the day, we have a very similar behavior. Uh, things start to be a little bit different when we look to the aggregation of sodium in those systems. In the left side, we have the radial distribution function between sodium and sodium. And looking to the radial distribution function, they still have a very, very similar behavior, but we can see a really a higher, a slightly higher coordination number in the protein system. So that means that we can expect a higher aggregation of sodium in the protein system. And when we look to the cluster analysis, the aggregation analysis in the right, so we see the probability to find a large cluster in the system, now we see something different. Uh, increasing the concentration of the uh, uh, sodium in the systems, we see an increase in the size of the aggregates, a decrease in the size. But when we look to 0 0.4 uh, concentration, we can see that the product system has a higher contribution of large aggregates, while in the a product and a liquid, we still have large aggregates, but we don't see like this prominent peak as in the protic system. And if we look to the ion cage lifetimes in those systems, now we see an interesting behavior and a different behavior. If we look to red, is the ion cage lifetime between sodium and the anion. Uh, in the aprotic system, we have the behavior that in general we expect in ion liquids. So increasing the concentration of the salt, we see the increase in the lifetime but when we reach 0.42, we see a decrease in this lifetime. And we can assume this that is because of the formation of the large aggregates. But when we look to the product systems, we see a decrease in the lifetime when we increase uh, the sodium concentration. And when we reach 0.4, we see an increase. So since that the system have a different behavior, but the formation of aggregates has an impact in both systems. Uh, for now, we do not know yet why is the reason, what is happening here, but we are investigating and I hope we are going to find the answer soon. But for now, if you look to the right side, we have a picture from the MD simulation. So we see the evolution of the sodium displacement along the MD. And here we can see how this ion pairing uh, works or how what's happened with the ion cage when we have the displacement of the sodium. So the Red spheres are the beginning of the simulation and the blue are the end. So we can see that in the beginning, the sodium is interacting with three uh, anions, the yellow, the green, and the purple. And once the sodium starts to move, one anion goes away, the uh, yellow one, but with some anions like the red, and sorry, the green and the purple stay together with the sodium. But in some point, the green leaves, uh, the purple one leaves but go back, so we have the break and the forming of the pair, but in some point the sodium changes uh, the ion cage. So this means that we have a change in the ion cage along the system, and this can indicate different uh, behavior in the diffusion mechanism. So uh, as conclusion, we see that the ion pairing is directly related to the transport properties of the liquids, but uh, 
it's hard because the ion pairing is dependent of the system composition, system structure. So it's some kind of complex uh, behavior. Also, ion cage is better to understand the ion pairing ion liquid than the simple ion pair. Uh, we can and we should consider structure factors, not like S of Q, but how the structure uh, influences the ion pairing. And simple force fields, like non parisable force fields, can describe the ion pairing qualitatively. And we can use uh, the ion pairing to weaker the interactions between soil and an ion to improve the electrolyte uh, performance. So I uh, would like to say thank you for everybody here. Thank you uh, for the invitation. And also would like to say thank you for my supervisors, Professor Barbara Kirchner, Professor Juarez da Silva, uh, my co-workers, and also my colleagues in Kirchner Group, and also the Ketanano Group. So thank you very much. Yeah.